Welcome back to class. In the first part of this lecture, we have seen that a high growth rate in money supply leads to inflation. So the big question is that when we know this kind of stuff, when we have this kind of knowledge, why is it the case that the central bank prints too much money? This question is related to a different question, namely the question, how can the government finance it, its spending? It can, on the one hand side, finance these expenditures by taxes or by borrowing in the form of issue bonds. Or the third alternative is print money. Or to be a little bit more precise, the government can print bonds and sell this bonds to the central bank and the central bank is printing money. So more or less, the question why does the central bank print too much money is related to the question why is the government forcing the central bank to print more money. This is due to the fact that frequently the government is not able to establish an efficient tax system or the private sector does not want to buy these kind of government bonds because the private sector does not trust the government. And when borrowing is impossible and taxing is impossible, then printing money is the only alternative which is available to finance government spending. By printing money, uh, the government and the central bank are causing inflation and thereby creating a so-called inflation tax. And this is uh, a term which I would like to highlight in the next few steps. I would like to talk about the inflation tax. Let's have a look. Like uh, some private people are holding this kind of money in the pockets and uh, when the goods price is equal to 10 Danish krona per chocolate bar then it is a case then that, that the private household can afford 10 bars of chocolate for this 100 uh, Danish kron uh, Danish krona note but what happens if the inflation rate is pretty high, the inflation rate is 100% and the goods price increases to the level of 20 Danish krona? In this situation, it is the case that the purchasing power of this 100 uh, Danish krona banknote has deteriorated tremendously and it is a case that suddenly the private household can only buy like five bars of chocolate. And this is called like the inflation tax. The real value of the banknotes deteriorates, the real value of banknotes decrease, and uh, this is labeled by the term inflation tax. So when the government prints money, inflation occurs, and then the government is like in uh, passing this inflation tax on uh, the private households, like who is taxed, the holders of money are taxed because the purchasing power decreases. The real value of money decreases in case that inflation occurs. This chapter was related to 4.2, Seigneurage, and now uh, we will highlight uh, the relationship between inflation and the interest rate by focusing on the so-called Fisher equation. You are already aware of the fact that there is a relationship between the nominal interest rate and the real interest rate. We talked about that before, like the real interest rate is equal to the nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate. What uh, the old guy Fisher did uh, is 
he put the inflation rate on the other hand side of the equation so that there is a relationship between the nominal interest rate, the real interest rate, and the inflation rate. So when we add the inflation rate on both hand sides of equation 20, then it is the case that we arrive at equation 21. We have isolated the nominal interest rate on one hand side of the equation and the nominal interest rate is equal to the real interest rate plus the inflation rate. And we can interpret this relationship in the following way, that countries which have a higher inflation rate also have a higher nominal interest rate. And this is also something we can have a look at how the empirical evidence looks like. So here in this scatter diagram, we have the relationship between the inflation rate on the horizontal axis and the nominal interest rate on the vertical axis. And also here, there is a positive relationship between inflation rate and nominal interest rate. So countries which have a higher inflation rate also have a higher nominal interest rate. And this is perfectly in line with the Fisher equation. So in case that the inflation rate is very high, then also the nominal interest rate is relatively high. When it comes to the Fisher equation, we have to be uh, to some extent a little bit more precise because there are more or less two real interest rates the ex-ante interest rate and the ex-post interest rate. The real interest rate that a borrower and a lender expect when the loan is made, we call this interest rate like the ex-ante real interest rate. The ex-ante real interest rate is equal to the nominal interest rate I minus the expected inflation rate. And the real interest rate that is actually realized is called the ex post real interest rate. And the ex post real interest rate is equal to the nominal interest rate I minus the realized inflation rate. The true real interest rate will differ in case that the realized inflation differs from the expected inflation. So the two real interest rates will differ in case that. Uh, the inflation is different from the expected inflation in case that there is a gap or a difference between uh, the realized inflation rate and inflation expectations. So the Fisher equation we had a look at so far is like the ex post Fisher equation. There we have this relationship between the realized real rate and the nominal interest rate and the realized um, inflation rate. When we once more isolate I on one hand side of the equation, we get to equation 23. So the real interest rate here in equation 22 or there in equation 23, this real interest rate is the ex post real interest rate. Let's also focus and introduce the ex ante Fisher equation. The relationship between the nominal interest rate and the expected real interest rate is ex as follows. The expected real interest rate is equal to the nominal interest rate minus the expected inflation rate. And when we now uh, solve once more for the nominal interest rate, we get to the ex ante Fisher equation. So the nominal interest rate is equal to the expected real interest rate plus the expected inflation rate. Unfortunately, the textbook does not differentiate between the expected and the realized real interest rate. The textbook uses the very same symbol R for the ex ante and the ex post um, real interest rate, which doesn't make too much sense, but I will stick to the textbook in the following. That's it with respect to this uh, subchapter 
inflation and the interest rate. In the next subchapter, subchapter 5.4, we talk about the relationship between the interest rate and money demand. So we will go back once more and uh, adjust the money demand relationship a little bit so that in the end money demand also depends on the interest rate. Why should money demand depend on the interest rate? When people hold money in their pockets, they are not earning the nominal interest rate I. People also always have two possibilities. They can hold money in their pockets or they could invest this money at the bond market and they would earn the interest rate I. So we can regard the nominal interest rate as the opportunity cost of holding money. In case that we hold money in our pockets, we are not able to earn the nominal interest rate. So holding money is costly. The larger the interest rate is, the higher the opportunity cost and hence the lower the money demand. So here uh, we have um, an equation which indicates that money demand depends on a function L, the liquidity function, and the two variables which are influencing the demand for money is the interest rate I and the GDP level Y. So we are already familiar with this influence of the GDP on money demand, K times Y, but here the new element is the interest rate in the demand relationship. When this element is introduced, when money demand also depends on the nominal interest rate, then the linkage between money supply and the inflation rate becomes a new loop. We have to add like this new loop, we have to add a new line of argumentation. Like until now, we were arguing as follows. In case that the central bank increases money supply, this will affect the price level, price level increases so that the inflation rate picks up, inflation rate is higher, and this leads to a higher nominal interest rate. But now uh, we have to consider that a higher nominal interest rate also affects money demand. Money demand decreases so that the difference between money supply and money demand becomes even larger. When money demand decreases, the price level will increase once more, the inflation rate will pick up once more. Like due to the fact that this new loop, like this blue arrow is introduced in this model, the uh, money supply shock of the central bank will have an even higher effect on the inflation rate. We have a direct effect, so central bank increases money supply and the inflation rate increases directly, but then the nominal interest rate increases, money demand decreases, and the inflation rate increases a second time because money, supply, money demand decreases. This is the indirect effect. Let's talk a little bit about the last insight which is derived in chapter 5.4. It is the insight that the expectations for tomorrow already influence the goods prices today. Why is that? Let's have a look at equation 28, where we have once more the money market equilibrium condition. Today's nominal interest rate depends on the inflation expectations for the future. So in the textbook, it is uh, mentioned that the nominal interest rate is equal to the real interest rate plus the expected inflation rate. Therefore, instead of working here with the nominal interest rate, we can also insert the sum of the real interest rate plus the expected inflation rate. 
So equation 29 highlights that the price level today depends on the inflation expectations. But what influences the inflation expectations? Inflation expectations are influenced by the expected monetary policy in the future. So what kind of monetary policy will be implemented by the central bank in the future? Therefore, it will be the case that expectations of a higher money growth rate in the future will already lead to a higher price level today. Or, putting it a little bit different, the price level today depends on a weighted average of the current money supply and the money supply which will prevail in the future. Or, when we are not talking about the price level but about inflation, then inflation is driven by both the current growth rate in money supply and its expected growth rate in the future. This is the end of subchapter 5.4. I would also like to make a break here and proceed in a separate video.